a few people on YouTube waiting as well. That's great. Shall we, shall we begin? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we'll say a quick, quick introduction. Right. Okay. Um, all right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the first Augmented Instruments Lab Open Seminar. And uh, thank you all for joining in person and uh, online, both on Zoom and YouTube. So very grateful to have Elliot Bates, pronouns they, them, joining us today to present a seminar entitled Interfacing Gear Cultures, a Critical Organology of Modular Synthesis. Uh, so Elliot is an Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology at the Graduate Center, City University of New York, who researches the interface between people and sound and music technologies. Uh, so Elliot is currently in Europe conducting field work for the research on modular synthesizers and gear cultures surrounding them. And very excited that Elliot was able to join us today in London to present on this topic. So thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Floor to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrew and Jordy, for the invitation to come and talk. And I'm uh, <clears throat> really looking forward to your feedback on this. Uh, yeah, what, what you think about this work in progress. Uh, so yeah, I kind of want to start um, here in, uh, in Superbooth in East Berlin in, in Germ Germany, which is a modular synthesis focused trade show festival that has been a popular standalone event in East Berlin since 2016. In May 2023, over 9,000 people uh, came to show, play, touch, feel, and listen to modular synthesizers and to be around other people who all wanted to do the same. With four live performance stages, over 200 exhibitor booths, and a dozen food trucks brought into the Bucolic Fez Center Park for a three-day non-stop extravaganza, <clears throat> not to mention the invite-only pre-show and post-show parties, this represents the largest modular synthesis event in the world. Uh, the professional trade show aspect is important. This event is not there only to allow prospective consumers to try out gear. It represents a key opportunity for small and medium businesses to connect with each other, to enter into collaborations, and to gain help with the logistics of running a manufacturing business. So let's, yeah, uh, here's a very uh, canonical sort of picture right here at the Bifaco booth, multiple hands reaching <laughs> to try to come and uh, you know either repatch or to you know touch a new module that has that's being released in this case the fx boy which uh, uses these little sort of like game boy style cartridges <laughs> um so the sort of creative attempt to create an interface inside an interface inside an interface uh this just gives you a sense of what the inside of what the main exhibitor hall the big sort of uh, uh area looks kind of like there with always the Korg booth down there and a bunch of modular synthesizer and, and standalone instrument makers up on the second floor. Uh, this is the sort of West Wing where a lot of the smaller manufacturers will be located. Um, you know, it gives you some sense of that. Uh, this is outside to the very left would be one of the main bars, long queue always to get a pint of some sort of uh, uh, Berlin regional pilsner. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of the booths though are outside in these tents. And so there's actually two areas that have uh, tents in which uh, exhibitors can show in, in a, in a, with a sort of different setting. This was an idea that came up at their first uh, exhibit that they had uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic when they wanted to deal with the sort of problems of airflow and, and try to reduce the risk of people, you know, uh, sharing uh, not just synthesizers, but COVID with each other. Um, this would be the other uh, one of the other outdoor areas with a stage back there and these little bungalows. One key thing to also remember about the Fez Center uh, in terms of as a site of play is that just two blocks behind here uh, is actually was a active Boy Scout summer retreat camp that happens there because this is the largest children recreational facility in all of continental Europe. So it's this massive park that also runs, yeah, kayaking things for 12 year olds and does, yeah, Boy Scout and Girl Scout camps and a variety of activities, right? Uh, so it's kind of uh, interesting and that's not, not ironic, but that, that you know, uh, children of a later age also get to come and play in the site as well. Um, 
this was another one of the one of two spaces where people can come and solder, you know, uh, kits of either Eurorack or standalone instruments. Uh, this was for a workshop for Error Instruments, which is a Dutch artist who creates these very interesting noise devices. Um, and also showing another a typical exhibition at the ALM Busy Circuits uh, booth. Uh, so yeah, just giving you some sense, uh, you know, making sound machines, uh, good friends of mine, uh, yeah, they were showing off their Stolper Beats, which is a, uh, a has a had a J Dilla button on it that allowed you to try to get uh, you know sort of the interesting sort of stuttery and uh, you know a rhythmic production. So it's a very uh, interesting approach towards uh, coming up, you know, trying to actually embed the aesthetics of entire artists into knobs and in buttons and into a you know a beat a beat based uh, four track beat based sequencer. Um, and finally, uh, one of the things is that uh, this is a trade show festival. It's a different kind of event. It's not just a trade show. It also has four performance stages where events are happening. Some people just go for the uh, for the stages, but as we see here, this is St. Vitus playing one of the most popular groups that played this year. There's only about 200 people there, and there's 9,000 people at the trade show overall. To give you an idea, a lot of people would never actually hear any of the performances. Some people are just going to play with synthesizers, right? I think that's quite key that the musical valences of these really is secondary. And that gets to a key point. Not, I'm not saying that music doesn't matter at all. It's just for a lot of people, their engagement with this space is in order to find objects for their own personal use rather than to say consume music or to collectively participate in some sort of music making. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, uh, oh wait, I'm missing a slide here. Okay, we'll skip over that. Um, yeah, one of the one of the other sites that that we find a lot of discussion would be on uh, public message forums. Like, for example, there's one called Mod Wiggler uh, that has been uh, was one of the main purpose you know purposeful sites for people to congregate about modular synthesizer discussions. Uh, Mod Wiggler used to be called Muff Wiggler until just about two years ago. Um, and it is a name that has caused some controversy over the years, but following the passing of the founder of the website there, a decision was made to maybe, you know, change the branding to uh, maybe avoid the potential confusion with some, you know, sexualized language. Um, but uh, it's still, it is a website where people will talk about their sexy gear and where it's a very common thing, show us pictures of your gear porn. Uh, uh, one of the most popular thread in Mod Wiggers, Muff Wiggers history, it, it starts with, yeah, show us your racks, show us pictures of your slutty gear porn. So that becomes a, and the fact that there's been 11,400 responses to that thread shows that that is a prompt that gets a lot of people quite excited to contribute and participate in that particular thread. So um, there's 45,000 members on, uh, now, Mod Wiggler, uh, at, with over 3.5 million posts, it is a key, key site, is the largest online site. So what connects these two things, these un seemingly unrelated ways of socializing, one built upon a traditional trade show or music festival format, the other riffing on common modes of online internet discourse that you might find in a gaming community or things unrelated to music, right? Um, <clears throat> In both instances, people have not come together due to a shared love of any particular kind of music. This is not a music scene per se. Like some people will be electroacoustic composers or sound artists or noise musicians or techno heads or whatever they are, you know, doing something different. Um, nor do people come together with a shared concern with musical performance practice or audio production techniques. People aren't coming to necessarily learn how to uh, do the practice of creating albums, you know, uh, and, and learning th that sort of side or honing their live sets so that they can, it deals better with the sort of idiosyncrasies of club sound systems. Uh, but because of people come together because one or more hardware technological objects, synthesizer modules specifically. So at trade shows, these technological objects, along with the tables that they sit on, are the main organizers of space and topological relations. They control where people get to go. Um, and they can determine where human bodies go and why. So a trade show highlight for any attendee is the new module reveal. Um, a tantalizing interface beckoning international visitors to look and feel and ponder just how much they might be gassing. Uh, gassing referring to gear acquisition syndrome, a, 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 a self-pathologized disorder where people 
you know, irrationally want to buy more modules than they need. Uh, I, gassing is the verbal form of that. So uh, international visitors, yeah, gassing over that new module on new module day. So if we go online, most form threads are organized around a specific object or a comparison between two or more objects, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, or problems that arise from a kind of technological object, like I can't get this to sync to this or, you know, various things. Technological objects therefore organize and regulate discourse, much in the same way that technological objects regulate where bodies go in the space of a, of a trade show, like Superbooth. Okay. So these are not isolated phenomena. Over 12 annual regional modular synthesis trade show festivals in the US, UK, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, and Japan, and formerly in Italy, France, Beijing, and Belgium too, uh, and I've heard that there's one in India, but I can't find much information about it, uh, showcase local variants in the technique for staging objects, and numerous platforms and sites for modular synthesis online uh, social interaction, ranging from email lists to message forums to Reddits to dozens of Discord servers to hundreds of YouTube channels to Patreon sites to Instagram and Facebook, likewise exhibit differences in interactional norms. These uh, tend to become like so, you know, somewhat self-contained communities of people that know each other and interact. But across all these, it is gear, those highly fetishized and problematic technical objects that brings people together more than anything else. Whether people go to encounter gear, to talk gear, to feel gear, to see gear, to hear gear, to make gear, or to sell or wholesale gear, they go because of a shared love of gear. Here's the thing, though. Most of this technology is technically obsolete. None of this stuff should be here. It's expensive and bulky, heavy, difficult to learn, hard to perform, often sounds bad, built upon problematically loose technical standards, and rarely can be made to respond in real time like an expressive instrument, whether we think of a piano or a keyboard-based synth or any other intermediate instrument. And in fact, actually, that gives a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, raison d'etre for a, a, you know, a laboratory such as yours that is trying to deal with the tactile control of these, you know, these these crazy objects, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, the backdrop to the huge revival of interest in modular synthesis, which you know begins, of course, in 1995 with Dieter Dope for introducing the uh, you know the the A100 system, uh, and starts to really pick up around 2005 when we get a lot of competitors in the marketplace, and by 2013 probably reaches a major peak when we have dozens of of uh, modular manufacturers and starting to get these trade shows. You know, the backdrop to that is so-called free environments or, or very, very low cost environments like VCV rack. And so if we look here, we actually find modules, Instro, which makes this module will cost you 300 quid to buy the bio. But this, um, yeah, this tag module, they provide this for free. You can get this for free. All the mutable instruments modules are available in VCV rack and they sound the same. I mean, yes, there might be just a little bit of difference from the AD to DA conversion and that analog stage at the tail end, but yeah, they they function pretty much the same. So if you can buy, if you if you can, <laughs> You know, just have a you know a high high spec laptop and get into this for free. Why spend thousands and tens of thousands of quid on a modular, right? So I would argue actually that the that the hardware modular synthesis revival is happening in spite of the increasing availability of low cost environments. And of course, we could think of Super Collider and PD and Max MSP and all the many other environments that also would then people have developed modulars for. Or, Cherry modular, reactor blocks, many, you have many options, right? That might actually tie into the rest of a, of a system. So, uh, you know, so uh, uh, let's just keep this contradiction in mind. There has to be some reason why people are not using this. I and mean, we, we can all probably imagine reasons, but again, as an ethnographer myself, I don't like to imagine the reasons. I'd like to actually find out from people what the difference is. And uh, many of us actually will try out a module in VCV rack before we actually go and buy one or two or four of them. Um, so, I mean, one of the main tasks um, today, uh, so why, what are we, where are we leading to? I've mentioned a bunch of different things, right, that might seem a little bit disconnected. So one of our tasks today is to try to use modulus synthesis as a case study for mapping out, first of all, what does constitute a gear culture? a culture that is organized around a certain class of technological objects or crafted objects more specifically. And our secondary task is trying to understand how interfaces and interfacing 
becomes a key problem and potential in that space. Um, what are gear cultures? What do they do? How do they work? And what are the limits of gear centric sociability? Okay. We won't arrive at a comprehensive answer to any of these questions, but they do demarcate the you know, problem space. So yeah, let's see. Uh, so yeah, the sequence today then is first, let's figure out what this gear thing is. What do I mean by gear? Uh, or I should say, what information have I collected about how other people regard what gear is? Because it's not necessarily my opinion about it that matters. Well, then we'll talk about what a gear culture is. We'll consider, uh, third, we'll consider different kinds of interfacing and interfaces, not just as a physical thing or as a visual thing, but as, some, as something that defines the relation between the individual synth user and a broader community, uh, which is one way I, I kind of like to think of it. And then fourth, we'll drill down deeper into what defines a gear culture using a sort of post-1995 modular synthesis as an example. So also please bear with me though, although I've published on some of these things in a couple of my book chapters and journal articles, um, some of this is very fresh and at times might be a little bit rough around the edges as I have yet to finish the book or two books, we'll see, um, that all my sort of uh, crazy research is leading to, um, you know, and, um, and as a, but maybe, yeah, as a sort of by way of transition, maybe as educator and YouTube content creator DivKid might say in the intro to one of his module walkthroughs, let's dive in, you know, so uh, first of all, gear, uh, what gear, what is gear? Gear is not just an empirical or, or material thing, since within any category of technical objects, some examples will be considered gear and other ones will not. Uh, rather, gear represents what happens when a class of crafted technological objects get promoted to a special fetishized status and are tasked with reproducing specific social effects. Uh, human social effects, I mean, though they, they, the, the technologies get promoted to the status so that human relations can be altered. To be gear, attitudes and practices must surpass any normal use value for that object. It's not just about this is a useful, I like this oscillator or something like this. It has to go beyond that. There has to be some extra thing. So gear status can be accorded to objects and gear status can be taken away when the objects are no longer perceived to be effective as social mediators. This is why one could, for example, buy vintage synths for a fraction of their new price during the 1990s. I got a Korg Monopoly for $65. Uh, no one wanted them anymore. <laughs> no one remembered what they were in the late 90s. And so I managed to get one for extremely cheap. They now go for $2,500 because they've been re-promoted to gear and mythologized in a variety of things. So again, status can be given and taken away. Um, for any gadget or gizmo uh, to be continually regarded as gear requires a lot of maintenance work on the part of thousands of gear culture participants. If there's no collective perception that the object is worthy of defending, and if people stop incessantly producing text and images that reiterate this perception, it may lose its gear status, becoming regarded as just another mundane technological object. Okay, so if we look around here, Things like, for example, an audio interface is rarely perceived by people that are avid gear culture participants as gear, because it's something that's expected is gonna stop working when there's a new interface on a computer and you'll throw it away. No one fetishizes old audio interfaces in that particular way. Uh, this microphone is not gear, but a fancy studio microphone is, right? So even within the same class of objects, we can find differences in perception there. And again, it's not based on what I think about it, it's, uh, you know, I tend to do sort of like a quantitative analysis of like how off is an object mentioned in a sentence with the word gear, um, you know, and I've done this, uh, you know, in different contexts. So I've used this word fetish though a couple times, but what do I mean by this? And here's where we need to take a brief tangent to understand how the word fetish came into the English and Portuguese languages to begin with. So according to William Pietz, anthropologist, in the original Portuguese writing about the fetisos, which is what they were originally term, that was the first word that came into Europe, uh, merchants uh, encountered along Africa's Gold Coast starting in the 16th century, fetisos were described as purposely crafted objects that autonomously wield power at a distance without the creator or owner needing to be in proximity. So it's not like the ring of power or something like that. You might, you know, Lord of Rings, it's different than that. You don't have to be wearing it. 
Um, and third, that are not a god or a divine object in the same way that a religious icon would be. Um, Karl Marx, who uh, kind of uh, enlivened the discourse around fetish, had read a little bit of this, but he actually hadn't read most of the colonial travel accounts, uh, and, particularly at, and particularly the ones that demonstrate that it was not just the Yoruba who, that were crafting objects in order to re resist colonialism. Portuguese traders, seeing the power of these objects to disrupt their trading operations, started crafting fetishas that they put on their on their merchant ships and creating these rituals for all the sailors to perform as well. So everyone working in this early colonial trade space was involved with crafting objects that were supposed to wield this power, okay? So a fetish works autonomously regardless of belief or symbolism, even though there are many beliefs and symbolic valences uh, to them. Um, uh, but noting that fetish objects have agency, because uh, that's what they're crafted to do, is to be an object that has agency, that also means that human beings, having delegated that power, now have lost that agency. So you craft an object to have power and to wield agency, that means that the human has lost that agency. This is as true of synthesizer modules that have been promoted to the coveted category of gear, as it is to figurines that were intended to disrupt colonial exploitation along Africa's Gold Coast. Please note, when I say fetish objects have agency, I'm not making a metaphysical claim about some spiritual or mystical quality that has been crafted into them, but I'm also not ruling out that that claim may not be made down the line. It's a bit immaterial because everyone behaves as if that magic power is self-evident and operative in that situation. So I'm cognizant that the entire social formation around these crafted objects depends upon everyone in the milieu, from the designer of the object to the consumer to the onlooker, treating the object as being so significant that it is <coughs> entrusted to mediate social relations between people. Yes, these are magical objects, and that's the point. We're going to have a flashing light here. Is that... Is that... Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, some of uh, you may also be familiar with the phrase sexual fetish. Uh, you know, that's another kind of fetish that we have in our language. So Samantha Bennett and myself um, are just finishing a six-year project analyzing recording studio gear cultures. Our book on the topic gear cultures of audio and music technologies will be published next year on MIT Press. One interesting finding of ours relates to the ways in which studio gear can be sexualized. Um, <clears throat> So, okay, yeah, here we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, in ways studio gear can be sexualized, especially online and at trade shows. In our article, which came out last year, uh, we analyzed thousands of posts on the site, which at the time was named Gear Sluts, where men talked about sexy microphones, about getting a boner for an LA-2A compressor, about the qualities that defined a true gear slut, and made comparisons of gear to sexy women and pinup posters. Um, gear Sluts, and the same can be said for mod wigger, muff wigger, are defined in, and defended as male and masculine spaces and as coded as white spaces too. And while technically women are allowed, regular users go out of their way to make women and LGBTQIA people feel unwelcome. Out of 430,000 registered users on gear slots, we only know of 12 who have regularly contributed openly as a woman. That 12. Um, I, I, we did go through, I, we did analyze 65,000 posts in one block of stuff just to really try to make sure we had a statistically significant sample. I've also been a registered user since 2002, so we very keenly remember if someone would actually show up who was openly presenting as a woman. And again, I can't say that that person is, but at least someone who was trying to openly present that way. Uh, so and the demographics are similar on Mod Wiggler as well, even though one of the moderators on Mod Wiggler is a woman uh, that has not. Uh, that has not done much to change the dynamics of the space. So, and particularly in the way in which the sexualization language happens, and there's references to women, and the uh, you know reposting of pictures of women holding keyboards or guitars or or in studios or things like this, you really get a sense that gear comes to replace the missing woman in these spaces, the missing women in these spaces. Um, you know, gear, therefore, okay, you don't have a crush on a woman walking down the street, you have a crush on that new through zero oscillator. There, 
you know, for example, the request on that that one post I was telling you about on Modwigger Muff Wiggler for gear porn could have been uttered on a digital photography forum or on a computer overclocking forum. That's because each of these represent a distinct gear culture, all of which sexualizes the gear in question. So uh, what we're talking about is not music specific. In our gear cultures project, it just so happens to be a music case study. But the exact same thing is going on on the forum of DP Review, uh, which is the largest digital photography message forum. You find it on, you know, F-Stoppers, Petapixel, and many other, you know, sites. And similarly, if you go to like mechanical keyboard caps and things like that, uh, overclocking, originally the Hackintosh forums, that's kind of died away. That's an example of a gear culture that's died. So, so this is, yeah, we're using a music case study here, but different kinds of techno crafted objects can, can serve the same role. So uh, to reiterate, much of this techno technology is technically obsolete, but attracts more attention now than ever before, especially if it is sexy. But that's weird since according to many ac academic accounts, we're supposedly uh, collectively experiencing a disenchantment and dis demystification of the material world due to scientific research, rational accounts and software simulations and online activity as well. On the other hand, as we see in every gear culture, never before have we seen such a widespread effort to re-enchant the world, to believe in the magical power of objects and to organize our lives around these magical powers delegated to crafted objects. This is just as true with a Nazar Bonjuk amulet with a 5,000 year history of warding off the evil eye in the Eastern Mediterranean, as it is with a silver faced complex oscillator module overloaded with knobs and LED lights being staged at a trade show. So, um, uh, no, okay, we'll get to there in a second. Some of these historical comparisons might have seemed a little bit abstract. So to, let's maybe reorient this around something we might all be more familiar with. Uh, take a detour into modular synthesizers, <laughs> detour into our main topic. And part of the part of the modules that more than any other galvanizes modular gear cultures, which is the interfaces. Um, right. So yeah, as Mark Verbos uh, uh, noted as part of his own particular design aesthetic. Mark Verbos has made a lot of Buchla inspired modules and is also a quite widely regarded as a live techno artist, performs with a 909 and a 6U uh, modular case and performs kind of around the world with that. You know, uh, like in the circuit bending world, they like the idea of just probing around until something crazy happens, but that's not where I exist because I want it to be repeatable and I want it to be controllable. So in fact, this really informs his particular design aesthetic of that repeatability and controllability. That's just him though. There's other people that uh, design interfaces with the exact opposite gestalt. So uh, for any object, synthesizers or otherwise, to be regarded as a musical instrument, it has to demonstrate its capability to produce some form of sound that is perceived by at least someone to be conducive to some sort of musical expression. But many kinds of objects have the capacity to do this, and this by itself doesn't really tell us anything of use, since many Eurorack modules are available as plugins, as we saw for VCV rack, where they nominally sound identical to the hardware version from which they're derived. I mean, we can nitpick about little differences, you know, in sound with the, you know, if you draw in an FM curve. But I mean, in effect, you know, for most use cases, we're dealing with stuff that would be sound-wise identical. So what is different is, it, there's, there is a difference, is between a tactile object, which provides a sufficient quality of haptic feedback, and a skeuomorphic on-screen representation of the same. Users wouldn't choose the hardware rather than the software due to the degree of parameterized control provided. The same number and kind of control elements can be skeuomorphically represented too. Instead, hardware modular performers often talk about, quote, happy accidents and their frequent lack of control over the instrument when reacting to the tactile and haptic experience of patching and knob turning. Uh, when thinking about the concept of interface and the practice of interfacing, they, there's then three different approaches that will be operative simultaneously uh, and three different kinds of problems trying to be solved. There may be more, but let's just stick with these three for now, just so we don't go until... Uh, dinner time. Uh, the first <laughs> relates to the aforementioned problem of controlling an instrument that is typically perceived to be inherently out of control. Modular synthesizers appear to provide more immediate access to parameterized control than other hardware instruments. I mean, you'll have more controllers to, you know, affect the timbre or the, uh, you know, the 
FM depth and, and you know and things like that, then you would often would be mapped out onto a standalone keyboard based instrument, right? Um, which is considered desirable, albeit with the potential to become unwieldy if the system is too large or the interfascial elements are difficult to tactically control. Like they have little trimmer pots and you can't quite get in there and accurately get exactly the, the resistance value you want. Um, <clears throat> certain interfascial elements and their aesthetics, especially knobs, faders, buttons, toggle switches, and to a lesser extent, transductive elements like capacitive touch or force sensing resistors, define the experience of the user, one which hopefully provides an ideal sensorium and a ludic sensation. Here's the display at the, um, at the SIFAM booth, at Superbooth, at nearly every modular trade show. Again, remember, these are business to business uh, trade shows, not just a uh, place for people who want to buy you know, synthesizers. So um, at nearly every modular trade show, a knob manufacturer, whether it's SIFAM or Rogan or you know some other one, uh, will have a display similar to this, primarily intending to inculcate B2B relations with manufacturers looking to get the ideal knob, but sometimes for users who wish to swap out the knobs for their entire system. And so they would get some customers that are like, I can't stand black colored knobs, I need silver colored knobs and go right here. And there's a number of dedicated stores that have popped up, including uh, Love uh, Love Your Switches uh, is a as a web store in the United States that we have that has done their own entire manufacturing runs of these custom anodized aluminum knobs that they have in six or eight different sizes. Yeah, they just all they sell is toggle switches, uh, push button things like you would find on guitar pedals and knobs, mainly for synthesizers for people that want to swap them out. I think they have 24 colors now. So if you want pink, teal, and gold instead of the typical, you know, silver and black or whatever, yeah, you can go nuts and swap out all of your knob, uh, you know, the, the knob part, not the potentiometer, but the knobs part, right? So, uh, you know, and this makes sense. I mean, thinking about William Methuson, who's uh, the founder of WMD devices and now the company Amped. So a company that's been uh, doing Eurorack since 2006. And at, for a while was the largest manufacturer of Eurorack based in Denver. They manufactured for 16 companies. So they actually had aluminum, uh, they, they had the capability to do aluminum face plates in-house to all the painting and anodizing and things like that themselves as well as pick and place machines and everything like that. So, you know, when I uh, interviewed him at, at WMD, you know, one of the points he made was, you know, talking about modular in general, it's all about the interface. The interface of Euro stuff feels analog, feels analog even when it's digital behind the panel. It doesn't matter what it's doing behind the panel as long as there's not a bunch of menus you gotta dive through. It's analog interface and it feels good. And he said similar stuff over the years. It's obviously a very key thing uh, to him. Uh, so when we map interfascial elements onto the user, we see that the modular performer, you know, maybe you, if you play modular, uh, constructs their selfhood, S-E-L-F-H-O-O-D, a selfhood largely through the sensorium. The individual subjectivity that can be felt or experienced, staged, and shared with others goes beyond the question of am I having fun, and far beyond do I like the sound, it becomes a question of who am I. The agony with which users rack and re-rack modules, making difficult trade-offs between more functionality and better tactile control ergonomics, because it's always very difficult to get a 6U case and have get as many voices as you want and also have enough control over it, and then the controls being usable. Uh, so this sort of like this trade-off between functionality and ergonomics is a key site where we see modular system configuration as a problem space regarding the future potential for that instrument to properly produce a ludic multi-sensorial experience that expresses something of the individual person behind the synth. We tend to think of a module interface perpetuating, you know, a module interface perpetuating the assumption that the controls and panel is, is that which comes between the user and the circuit. But this is a bit misleading, especially if we care about two things. One being the role of the instrument in producing selfhood. Um, uh, and the routine reconfiguration of the uh, instrument that all module users undertake on account of it failing to fully embody this role. The unstable nature of the uh, uh, unstable nature of the modular instrument and the not yet fully formed selfhood of the user means we can't really pinpoint the interface here since neither of the surfaces is fully formed. Like you can change around the instrument 
and you haven't quite figured out as a person like what is the feeling <laughs> that uh, uh, that you feel a part of yourself and also is, is is an expression of yourself if you get to share it with other people. Um, so instead, the concepts of intraface and intraaction, both coming out of Karen Barad's theory of agentive realism, are more apt here. A bonus knock-on effect of working with Barad is that their concepts also get much closer to helping us understand for the many uh, transgender, non-binary, queer, and gender non-conforming synthesizer musicians, those queering effects that come from intraaction with modulars, including that co-construction of modular and the, you know, the modular, the instrument, and user, right? Okay, so this is one way, I mean, it's pretty, uh, you know, maybe where I've gone with this is, is not always the most conventional way, but we kind of understand this, right? The interface is being this tactile control service, but it's kind of a problem. It can be changed. It might not feel good. I'm unhappy with it. It's not me, <laughs> right? That, that all kind of makes sense from our performances. But of course, there's also another problem is that this is all built upon you know, there was one standard and there's a specification for the A100 system, but lots of stuff that is going in and out of a, any hardware modular synthesis synthesizer does not fit within there. So modular system, you know, the, there's a, a lot of need for a modular system user to perform operations that enable the modules of the synthesizer to work either properly with each other or with an external device, right? Um, trying to get any external sequencer or DAW to interface with a modular can be fraught with problems that lead the user to need to care about 24 you know, PPQN clock or gate length and delay, or whether an audio interface is DC coupled and what each pin of a 3.5 millimeter TRS MIDI uh, connector actually transmits, being that there is no standard for a 3.5 millimeter uh, MIDI. Um, the five pin DIN has a standard, but the 3.5 doesn't, and the pins will be different depending on who designed the module. Um, as similarly, uh, you know, uh, since formats such as Eurorack were originally intended to only provide plus and minus 12 volts rather than the five volt bus that was added later, um, and, uh, and, and assumed that all inter module patching would be done with patch cables on the front. All these various additional semi-standards by IntelliGel, Industrial Music Electronics, TipTop, and others, including things that save patches or allow hardwire patching underneath, um, are, are, are all add new inter-device interfacing that is not guaranteed to work because it's not built upon a rigorously uh, defined standard uh, and very hard to get in there and measure. I mean, you need to get in there with a scope and, <laughs> and start doing circuit traces when everything goes wrong, which is not quite so fun as sitting there and patching with a, and turning knobs. Um, right. So um, I bring these up since none of these relates to the creative aspects of music, nor do any of them assist with the more playful querying potential of synthesis interaction that we just discussed. In these modes of interfacing, the machines have complete agency and the users have delegated their own agency in order to hopefully get the machine to work. They need to do what the machine needs, otherwise nothing is going to happen at all. That's a very different kind of situation, right? So again, this is the second kind of interfacing that's happening simultaneously on top of the first. And our third one that we will deal with is that the modular synthesizer in its mediating role, again, as I said, within gear cultures, these objects are called upon to mediate social relations between people. So the modular synthesizer in its mediating role is called upon to serve as the surface on which discourse is uttered. This is the case because of the central role of these material objects in mediating all aspects of social relations and the importance accorded to object ownership for being able to participate in any space specific to this gear culture. Hence the notable problem at modular synthesizer performances of all sorts, whether at a neighborhood meetup or at a festival, and I have this from personal experience, I'm one of the co-organizers of the New York Modular Society events. We do three, probably three shows a month at this point. I think we've hosted maybe 500 artists total over the point of our career. So I've, I've gotten to see a lot of shows and, and, and get a, a pretty decent sample size. So I finished performance and someone comes up, oh, hey, that was great. So uh, what module did you use to is the first question that happens right after there, which is a fair enough, it's a fair enough question, but that's different than like, oh, hey, I was moved by the song or, oh, hey, I love that rhythm that you have, that beat was, sick as fuck or whatever it is, you know, um, it's a different question. So when the individual stages modules, this provides them the entree to capitalize on widespread gear fetishism and become a meaningful interlocutor 
for someone else's modular journey, okay? You have information that they might be able to use that might make their experience more ludic and sensorial and pleasurable, right? Hence, there are people within my community of modular enthusiasts who are more likely to know me as that person who modulates a morphogene with the strange attractors and has figured out microtonality on the 512 vector rather than as an academic, a teacher, a writer, or a musician, right? Oh yeah, cool. Oh, you got rid of the vector? Why'd you get rid of it? You know, whatever, yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, which is cool. I mean, it's it's fine. Uh, the fetish power of gear here also allows the user to, to stage a different kind of selfhood. I don't have to be the academic at the gig. I'm a modular user, just like someone else, right? Therefore, modular instruments, more specifically those aspects that are best apprehended through their front panel interface, because again, people don't really necessarily see what's going on in the circuit. They see that they're they see the front panel and they see the tactile control happening in real time and respond to that. Um, mediate not just our conversation, but it can be leveraged for the social performance and receptions of one's self. Uh, recall though, that these selfhoods are in the process of formation. They're not fully formed. <laughs> They're uh, negotiable and changeable and always in interaction with an unstable instrument that also is in the process of formation. So in summary, the gear is either being approached in the hope of a ludic and multi-sensory experience, being approached because the user must subjugate themselves to the gear that is unable to work with other gear or technologies, or at least right out, right out of the box, or being approached in order to interactively create a different selfhood that mediates all human social relations in a space, either online or offline or both. That's a lot of expectations for that poor filter or envelope or utility module, right? Much more than it's really set up to do well, you know? It's just a utility module. Well, no, it's not just a utility module. It's much more than that, right? So, uh, but it also helps us make sense uh, why, say, within the URAC product market, there are seven companies that only offer alternative faceplates for commercially available modules and multiple online companies that provide these knobs that you can totally customize your entire system with. The surfaces are what one most often encounters first at the trade show and online. Okay, so back to gear cultures, right? So we have some sense of gear. We've now thought about how interfacing, uh, you know, and interfaces is sort of like separate the technical object into like the bit that's functional and then the bit which has the the best capability, both for the personal experience and also for the uh, social interaction. Um, and now we kind of need to wrap up. So like, how do we get a whole culture? Uh, what do I mean by culture in this? So a gear culture, as defined by myself and Samantha Bennett, is a social formation where gear objects are the number one mediator of social relationships and where participation is dependent upon you using, owning, touching, caring about, talking about, and ultimately loving gear. This makes a gear culture a very specific phenomena, one where a lot of stuff is added to the already considerable complexity of technological objects. As I hinted already, <laughs> while module synthesizers, modular synthesizers and recording studio gear represents two music-focused gear cultures, that's more coincidental than anything, uh, since most gear cultures are not music-related. That said, all gear cultures build upon a pre-internet history of neighborhood technology user groups, technology trade shows, magazine publishing, and professional trade associations. Uh, with the expansion of social interaction possibilities online, they gain enough inertia to transform from a hobby or interest to a more large-scale culture. So gear cultures are only really possible due to the large-scale sociability that's, a, that's possible through you know, these platforms. Okay, so gear cultures contain a number of distinct features. Uh, first of all, gear must be staged in multiple ways, in multiple spaces, and through multiple media. Hence my interest in trade shows, neighborhood meetups, and the relation to traditional print and emerging online media. Note that staging is not the same as use. Staged gear is often inoperative, and some gear culture consumers are in fact not gear users, they just collect kinds of gear. So we know plenty of people in New York Modular Society have never performed uh, once in a show, uh, we do not know if they actually play very much at home, maybe a little bit, but that's not their main thing. They just find them to be aesthetically interesting objects. 
Uh, and they get that because of the very creative ways in which people are staging gear. As we see here, some of the diff very different personalities of the modular designers inflect the way that this gear gets to be staged. So again, the human and the interface <laughs> working together to create a sense of what the object can mean. Um, uh, the second thing would be there must be a specific language uh, to this gear used only within the gear culture. Obviously, there's a language around any technology. We can't really talk about an oscillator without talking about volt per octave input or talking about you know, you know, you know, linear FM and exponential FM. But gear cultures feature their own local argot. For example, if I say to you rings into clouds or houseplant ambient, or you can never have enough VCAs or cat sun synthesizers in outer space, this would make no sense unless you've participated in the online spaces where those phrases were invented, became relevant, and attained meme status. So we see there's an entire web store that just sells t-shirts of cats on synthesizers in outer space following this online discussion that has happened in a couple of web forums. If you need any new t-shirts, there you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's a locally specific language. Uh, it's less the case in modular, but sometimes it is that actually there will be pseudo-technical language that actually doesn't really index a true technical feature. So people will use things that sounds like technical discourse, uh, but that actually is utterly meaningless to anyone that is an engineer. That uh, It's more of a problem recording studio gear cultures um, and in things like high fidelity audio and things like that. We definitely see that all the time, talking about how the width of the soundstage coming out of a single point Cardioid microphone is my favorite, I think. How can you have a wider sound stage from a mono microphone? Anyways, it's apparently possible. Uh, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> have fun with that. Um, so the other thing, uh, the third thing would be that their gear culture is not just a thing where people love to talk about what's happening now. There will be local self-designated historians who, um, and other, in general, there'll be a belief that the gear uh, and the gear culture is significant and valuable and is worth consider uh, spending considerable personal time discussing the beliefs about this. So, I mean, for a decade, it was expected that being a modular synthesis, in, a th synthesis enthusiast meant allegiance to analog only technologies. And that only really started to change in around 2006. And it was so slow process before that really was quite accepted. So that was a Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I, I, I just jumped down. Okay, let's go back up to the history. Okay, uh, so yeah, gear cultures essentially self-document themselves, producing excessive amounts of content in the form of interviews and factory walkthroughs, podcasts, and gear talk sessions, memes, and fan artwork, blog posts, and museums. So one user wanted to know, make a world map of where modular synthesizers are made. No one asked them to do that. They just took it on upon themselves. Kim Bjorn has made an entire publishing industry out of books about dealing with, you know, uh, well, guitar pedals and synthesizers. Uh, I think he has one on the uh, Moog synthesizers too. Uh, you know, Sam Battle, uh, look mum, new computer, started a museum uh, down in Kent area or whatever, uh, originally to house like esoteric synthesizers and now like telephone, you know, multiplexers and other, odd objects and things like this. But also, um, uh, but the, that's not the, th those are some of the colorful and, and kind of playful versions, but you find people within some of the gear forums lamenting that there's been a culture change within the space and uh, we're trying to remember the way it used to be before the influx of newbies who allegedly brought a different and less desirable social norm into the mix. So a gear culture history is therefore one to be defended and just as much concerned with remembrance as it is with intended as a power play for articulating the culture's true values. It will often, but not always, represent a gear culture's most conservative flank. Okay, so back to the beliefs. I started to chat about this already. There are semi-regulated beliefs in the space. You know, gear, we have to believe that gear is important and valuable and that's worth spending considerable personal time discussing it, right? For a decade, it was expected that mod you know, modular synthesis was about analog modules and digital was bad. That's changed a little bit. Um, and, and some beliefs there's some wiggle room, but there are definitely unpopular wrong opinions about what is good and bad gear, the correct way to use gear, and the correct feelings to have about certain specific gear. 
Uh, one place we can find this is with like, for example, the company Behringer has come up with a number of clones of currently available modules, which has created quite a polarization in the community. We had to ban any discussion in Behringer in our discord because uh, the majority of people, one person who would say, oh, Behringer is making it accessible for the little guy. I, I, I'm using the euphemisms that always get trotted out, making it accessible for the little guy, you know, because it's way too much expensive or whatever for the original companies that made these things. And then you'll get the very, very interesting uh, backlash of people saying, actually, mutable modules are not expensive enough. They should be more expensive. So where do you, so the, the interesting thing is that there is a, there is a belief also that modular is outside of capitalism and outside of capital relations. And you get these peculiar things where you get consumers arguing that modules should cost more than that they do, which again, is hard to kind of fit into certain capitalist accounts. Yet it still is a very capitalistic space because the idea being you should have a lot of disposable money to prove your worth to the gear community. Like if you haven't put up 10,000 quid for your module, what, why are you messing around, you know, <laughs> put up or shut up, right? So, so, so we're in this weird paradox. You know, that we find weird paradoxical, paradoxical situations in some of these kinds of beliefs. Um, this obviously, if, if it's not obvious, do uh, create some barriers to entry, right? Uh, imagine uh, trying to recruit new people to come into the gear culture. If the expectation is that that cost of entry is you know, 10,000 quid or something like that, uh, it takes someone that already knows that they want to be dedicated and who so happens to have a lot of money just sloshing around there. <laughs> well, uh, where did that money come from? So we find a lot of people that actually have very, very expensive modulars. Uh, it's a result of intergenerational wealth, not based on personal gain and things like that. So obviously that's going to affect the demographics of the space and who's able to participate along, reigns, uh, you know, along lines of race, class, and gender. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's where beliefs get. It can be. Uh, it can become this really interesting thing that's sort of gatekeeping in the community, uh, and does many other things too. So uh, we also need multiple online spaces. Uh, you know, whether they're forums or discords or Instagram or Facebook. You know, I did try to just kind of consolidate some of these ones here, but this is not a complete list by any means. But it just shows you. Uh, one of the things is that because by expressing the wrong beliefs or participating in these online spaces, a lot of people do get kicked out or ostracized. So there's a need for multiple spaces. There's a need for people that have those aberrant beliefs to find a place where that they can, you know, based on the norms of one community, uh, to find a place where they can participate. So they each have very different social dynamics, although all of them typically are dominated by some kind of hegemonic masculinity. Uh, gear cultures, at least, um, uh, at least in the present form, uh, you know, uh, depend upon internet and computer-mediated communication uh, to gain the, uh, the scope or inertia that they have. I'll get back to the masculinity uh, topic in just a sec. Uh, but however, gear cultures cannot coalesce in just one place, particularly since they often can be, uh, you know, antagonistic spaces. You know, as I mentioned, users being driven off. Um, you know, uh, channels. Uh, uh, you know, due to a dislike of the interactional norms there or trampling on my free speech or whatever it is, uh, is quite common. Um, okay, so we get some sense of that, I hope. Uh, the other thing is that um, gear cultures, this is another criteria, uh, is that they have to become so significant that a quorum of people, not, not millions or, or even thousands necessarily, but some significant examples of people get so deep into the gear and the culture that they drop their former careers to work full-time in gear cultures. So I know of at least 12 YouTube content creators that that's their full-time job is running the Patreon, the Discord, uploading YouTube videos all the time. Uh, many modular stores exist. There's now, I think, four in the UK, and I've met a lot of the employees there. They work full-time there. That's their gig. Um, I know at least a hundred people. Oh, I don't know. I haven't met each one, but who work in contract assembly facilities that are specific to making electronic instruments. Some of these were opened up. You know, small contract assemblers. You know, uh, there's one in uh, Riga, Latvia, that apparently caters to a lot of the market. And it's mainly like synth heads that are, you know, musicians who are actually working there with pick and place machines and doing wave soldering and whatever else is going on there. Hand soldering all the components that can't be uh, that can't be semi-automated right so um so 
for some gear culture diehards, it becomes what anthropologists would term a total way of life. It is literally their work and also their recreation, their family and everything. Um, so, um, so far, despite the variety of technologies that can bring people together, all the gear cultures we could find were predominantly male homosocial spaces, meaning that they were designed by men, well, allegedly designed by men. We, we probably should pry that apart. Some of them actually, there were women that were involved in the, in the setting up of the architecture of the space that, whose contributions get sidelined, uh, but are working on behest of men, i.e. not given too much flexibility in the design parameters, but let's just say designed by men, scarecrows, <laughs> investigate further, uh, for male users and characterized by locally specific kinds of hegemonic masculinity. So um, hegemonic masculinity is a kind of tricky concept at first, since it may sound, some of us may jump to saying, oh, that's toxic masculinity, but actually they're very different things. I mean, you could have a space that is, has a hegemonic masculinity, which is also a toxic masculinity, but not necessarily. It's just any, in fact, uh, it refers to a form of masculinity that becomes the dominant form of social expectation, um, even though a majority of the people in that space do not actually believe in it. So in that uh, Muffwig or Modwig or uh, form, which I mentioned before, all evidence suggested that most users do not subscribe to the idea that gear should be sexualized, but they also don't challenge it because they don't want to be socially ostracized. So it's actually a minority of the users that maintain this ramped up uh, sexualized language gear discourse as a way of you know, trying to mark the space as having particular sort of social dynamics. And other people, either they could try to challenge and then get shouted down or insulted or gaslit, or in the case of the site Gear Sluts or Gear Space, some people, there were actually swatting incidents and doxing attempts that happened against some users there. So it can go to QE Farms level of like really shitty internet stuff when people get upset that you are critiquing their favorite bro hangout. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but, but the hegemon in this case would be described as by many as toxic and also sexist. Um, you know, on the lines forum though, which was the forum that was developed originally as product support for the monome platform of products, and now has become a general gear form, they talk about, uh, all users talk about as being a quote unquote gentle place and a gentle masculinity. Uh, and that gentle masculinity is hegemonic, although there's no evidence that the majority of the users there actually subscribe to that. People have to fall in line and try to tone down their discourse, otherwise they get kicked off of the forum. Thus, not every gear culture is gendered masculine in the same way. And perhaps we may eventually find woman-led gear cultures too, like something that's at the scale that is a gear culture or a kind of gear uh, that is in a, in a, in a woman-dominated space, in which case we could look at hegemonic femininity in that space. But at least at this point, we, ha we I cannot say for sure that, you know, you know, we can say for sure that over a dozen of unrelated gear cultures around unrelated crafting objects all sh share similar gendered norms. Okay. So yes, calling gear cultures cultures is neither a euphemism nor an exaggeration. They possess every characteristic that a colonial era anthropologist would have looked for to determine if some tribe were indeed a discrete, hitherto undiscovered culture. Uh, you know, they develop, they have their own mythology, they have their own cosmology, their own local language, they have a material culture, <laughs> they have beliefs, they have rituals, they have practices, they have a durability over time, they produce their own history and historiography. So, um, so how large are we talking about here? Uh, most estimates uh, from talking to uh, retailers and also uh, looking at the web forums, again, 45,000 people are on Modwigger. Um, uh, but there seems to be around 50,000 regular customers at, per, I believe, it, uh, you know, at some of the retailers that I've talked to. Uh, so the most estimates that we have are definitely more than 50,000, potentially as high as 150,000 people worldwide are participating in this gear culture. It could be many, uh, there could be many more people that are involved in modular synthesis, but are not actively involved in a gear culture. They just buy the stuff and use it at home. But what is unique compared to a traditional culture as defined by you know, anthropologists is the overemphasis on material objects, material culture. Like that bit gets so ramped up much more than it would in, uh, you know, in a national culture or something like that. Uh, and this particularly happens in online spaces. So that dichotomy between the physical material objects and online discourse is absolutely essential, okay? So, um, you know, Samantha Bennett and I coined the term gear cultures to try to analyze how and why 
large scale cultural formations can coalesce around special classes of technical objects more than around any other factor and remain durable for years. So for those of you familiar with the concepts of scenes or subcultures you know, in music, a, a gear culture is not only a different cultural formation, it is a different kind of cultural formation. It doesn't follow any of the logics whatsoever. The Gear Cultures Project contributes to other calls to reverse the assumption and early internet research, but one that we find being echoed by journalists to this day, that computer-mediated sociability leads to a dematerialization of the world and social life. It doesn't. Uh, in Gear Cultures, especially online, crafted objects are, are re-enchanted and accorded special powers. As module designer and, uh, and Knobcon trade show organizer Sutton Tai Guy, that's, I, I think his name is Eric, but I've not even been able to find his last name. He's just gone by Sutton Tai Guy for 20 years. Uh, as he said in 2020, what we do is sell low ticket luxury goods, and these are not commodities, right? Getting back to that weird ambiguity around capital. Um, there's many topics I have not touched upon today, including the way that modular economic valuation ties into modular values, meaning the evaluations of what is right and wrong um, for the community. This also ties into the notable ways that modular participation relates to social class performativity, which shouldn't be surprising considering the role of conspicuous consumption within these spaces in reproducing gear culture selfhood. Uh, let's keep in mind most performance rigs I've seen being used in live shows cost a minimum of 5,000 quid, uh, with the average cost being more like 10,000, uh, and I've seen many uh, upwards of 25,000. Studio setups can easily spiral to several times that cost, and extremely few people make any money from playing these, whether for live shows or studio recordings. They certainly not to the extent that one would call it an investment in a professional music career that one is making for that particular purpose. Like you might buy a really good, you know, guitar if you're going to be touring with that one guitar and you need something that is just, you know, bulletproof. But the modular, you know, the gigs are very poorly paid. So and we haven't really talked at all about sound or music or the practice that individuals develop to get closer to their modular and discover its expressive capabilities. But that's not where gear cultures gain their power, at least primarily. It is there, sure, but by starting with the interface and the various practices of interaction and intraaction between people and gear and between gear and other technologies, we can start to feel, touch, look, and hear those relations that then get staged, whether at trade shows, performances, meetups, or online. We can begin to sense why in these cockpits of spaceships designed for interstellar voyages and sound, the journey may begin and end with the instrumentation controls, the knobs, the faders and buttons, which provide the greatest potential to convert haptic ideation to ludic reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot. Yeah, fantastic, very interesting. Um, yeah, so we have we have time for discussion. So if anyone has any questions, ask away. Um, same on Zoom, and I'll look at the chat on YouTube as well. Any questions? That's it. That's gear culture. Really inspiring talk. Um, have you looked at all at the relationship between the gear culture and the the role of standards and and kind of technical interfaces? For example, to the modular sit gear culture, everything is working with the CV, for example, right? That, you know, in one way, it's it's very standardized. You have certain kinds of patch cables. You also have a certain format for Eurorack, which is the predominant, um, uh, I guess, modular format these days. But it's also reasonably open-ended. And you might contrast this with something like, like MIDI, for example, which was actually actively designed by a specific consortium of manufacturers. Yep. And you can even go further into other standards that might become a kind of walled garden. I mean, I don't know that an app store ever becomes a gear culture for a lot of reasons, but the idea that there is ultimately one big player that gets to decide who gets to exist within this ecosystem. I'm just wondering, do you see ways in which the relative openness or the relative sort of determinedness of these standards influences the kind of culture that emerges? Well, maybe I'll take one example, which would, as you mentioned, CV. So let's talk about voltage ranges, perhaps. Because, uh, I mean, we have with uh, plus and minus 12 volt power, uh, when you lose a little bit on both ends from putting protection diodes, you realistically have uh, you know, plus 10 volts and minus 10 volts. And so often pitch range will be zero to 10 volts. But effectively, you could have 20 volts peak to peak. 
which is quite a wide voltage swing. But not all modules will do that. And you have a problem with like, say, for example, an envelope. If you have an envelope generating module, you put a gate, you know, gate in there, what is the range going to be? Is it zero to five? Is it zero to eight? Is it zero to 10? Some of the modular manufacturers don't even say. So you have a lot of discussion that will happen. Uh, it becomes a real problem of like, yeah, what, what is the, you know, how long does the gate need to be high before the detection will kick in? So the lack of any standards of that and the lack of a standard documentation of that can create a lot of interoperability problems meaning that you have a whole separate class of modules like gate delay modules that deal with the fact that maybe you're triggering the gate a little bit too quick because you have a gate to trigger converter or a trigger to gate converter and then it, it, it ends up doing something before it's supposed to so you can dial in a few millisecond gate delay uh, or a whole set of class of these utility modules that basically fix problems because manufacturer A's approach towards a gizmo is different than B's and they're using different voltage ranges. How is a module going to respond to negative voltages if it's mainly, you know, trying to, you know, like for example, a uh, if you're if you're if you're doing a sample and hold and trying to, you know, and do a sort of stepped random voltages or something like that, what's it going to do when it gets into the negative voltage swing? Who knows? <laughs> and it, the, the manufacturer may not tell you. And manufacturers will get in arguments with each other online over the fact that someone else's module didn't really respond well to this, that that made my module not work very well <laughs> with the system. So that can come, come, come uh, it can be a bit of an issue, particularly since Eurorack is actually inheriting bits of the Surge and the Buchla and Moog and other systems as well. And all of those had a different gestalt, different voltage ranges and different ideas about what you should do. Like some of the older patching systems would say you should not mix audio and CV. But a lot of modular users now like to mix audio and CV and put a gate into the audio input somewhere because it, they can get an interesting effect. <laughs> so uh, all of this creates quite a lot of either. I mean, if it turns into that happy accident, as is talked about by many artists, then that's great. But if it doesn't, yeah, you're, you're struck going onto Modwigger and saying, does anyone know what the envelope range is supposed to be <laughs> on such and such a module? And then the designer will say, well, it doesn't matter or whatever, you know, kind of thing. So I don't know. That's just one example of a, of a space there where even the open-endedness of it, you know, typically is more of a problem, but it can lead to interesting outcomes. And it's contingent upon a designer having thought through and cared about that and wanting to either put protection diodes or put a rectifier on the input to, or not put a rectifier on there and ignore all the lower, you know, below zero volt swings or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, I guess I just wonder whether there, there is a kind of sweet spot of open-endedness because some, I think there would be lots of objects that would essentially not fit into this overall ecosystem to begin with because they're not the right size and shape and they just fundamentally don't right. do that. Right. But then ultimately something that is too restrictive in what kinds of information is exchanged between modules and how they uh, how they would fit together, but you might ultimately sort of crush the open-endedness where the kind of, right. the kind of partially working, partially not working, perhaps that's an interesting feature. Sure. Yeah, some people, particularly working in... Uh, and noise or in drone or more abstract things where they're not necessarily trying to get uh, accurate pitch uh, or you know uh, accurate harmonic relations between multiple objects or something like that will be much more excited by those quirks about what happens when you put uh, you know out of bounds voltage into a thing. I, what I would say is that the open-endedness and the real loose standard certainly made there to be much lower barrier to entry uh, for any modular designer to become a designer because you don't have many things. All you have to make sure is that it plugs into a plus or minus 12 volts and doesn't brick anything else in, in neighboring modules in the system. If it does something, you got a module. And I mean, uh, you can just breadboard it first. And if that worked out well, worked okay, Vero board it, that worked fine. You know, learn KiCad, follow one of Moritz Klein's like you know uh, YouTube videos on how to do your first KiCad you know file. Send it off to JLC PCB, and you'll have a fully manufactured module sent back to you in two weeks. It, it costs not very much money. That's really different than the accounts told by people fifty years ago who were trying to make synthesizers and the difficulty of even finding parts or things like that. You know, you don't even need to have the parts. They they have them all over there. So uh, over there, you know, and there's other companies that do the same, but at a higher cost or whatever. So, I mean, that certainly 
uh, allows people to approach it very open-ended and, and create a gizmo that might be very useful for a small number of artists, even though it's out of bounds based off of other modules or you know other things like that. Yeah. 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 I see a hand up. Hey, Jeff. Hey, guys, Jason, I just thought about to do that. All right. Oops. Whoops. I, I, one second. I'm getting some feedback from YouTube. Let me turn. Here, let me. I'll I'll mute here and then unmute. How about that? Hey, Jeff. Do you want to ask a question here? Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear what was going on there. Um, yeah, so first of all, I just want to say thanks. It was like really not what I was expecting, but exactly what um, I'm happy I heard, if that makes any sense. Um, hey, <laughs> so first of all, I think it's quite funny that you're discussing gear culture and everything, because I mean, basically I've got the back of a modular synth there, but I'm sitting in a room with like 14 tubas here. Um, so I'm an instrument collector and, you know, sort of brass instrument performer person. And it is interesting how many of those instruments you know i've got because they they have a specific role in specific types of music and kind of what i do that's it's kind of a requirement that that you have that um but on the other hand i know people that you know will have 100 instruments and some of them they've never played before you know just because they think well i haven't got one that's got this combination of this thing and that other thing and so um i, I guess i basically just had two questions you can answer either one of them or both or neither um, one of them was, um, it was interesting, the role that, uh, the question that you had about the perceived value of gear, uh, particularly specifically with Behringer, because um, I know that's like an ongoing debate and everything. Um, and I just wondered, you know, is there, is there not like, well, I mean, what are the thoughts on the role of basically, um, not role, but the, the existence of gatekeeping? Because I mean, basically a lot of this, it's like, oh, you know, this is our club and we, we don't actually want anyone else in it because that makes what we're doing and what we have less special, I think. Cause you know, you see that with, you know, these brass instruments and then, you know, often they're like inexpensive Chinese copies and they're not, you know, in that case, they're probably not quite as good and not as accurate copies, but um, you know, people are, are threatened by that. And I find that, I find that really interesting. Um, and then the, the second thing I just wanted to ask about was um, in terms of interface design and, you know, like why, why do we like these physical objects more than um you know digital recreations that we can you know you know have in a virtual space um i just wanted to say that for me i think a lot of it's about um the serendipity of the experience and so like if you're working on something where you're having to go through uh menu diving or you have a single mouse it's like having one finger or maybe one finger and thumb um it's almost like you you have to lead the the interaction with the machine because you've got to think oh i need to do this or i want to do that whereas you know when everything's there you just sort of it's so much faster to be able to just kind of twist stuff and do things and see what happens and think ah now that's interesting because i wasn't expecting that so i just wondered what um you know if there was any stuff that's been done about the kind of the the role of serendipity in, in these different types of interfaces and, and how it's how it's affected by tactility and just kind of a, you know having this one monodimensional interface where you can see everything all at once sure yeah yeah thank yeah thanks for your questions do you want to mute there and i'll go clear microphone here okay yeah uh, regarding the first one i mean uh again as the um you know as a ethnographer it's not necessarily my my duty to you know answer the debate about the morality of Beringer copying other people's devices it's more useful for me to be a conduit for for the variety of stories, right? I mean, I have my own opinions about it. I've met Uli actually at one point, so um, you know, I I know the not very well, but I have a little idea of what the the person is. But uh, the fact that it becomes so weaponizable in me mediating social uh, values, and we find this sort of two different contexts being argued there. One is, as you've mentioned, the gatekeeping, we have our own little private club, and we don't want other people to come in. Um, and the virtue is like, oh, it's giving it to the, to the little guy. But then I also look at the racks of the people that are buying the Behringer, and it's not like they've only bought four $99 Behringer modules. They still have thousands of dollars of modules. I'm just, I'm very puzzled by that. I've never seen anyone that's like, because of the Behringer modules is the only reason that they're able to now participate in modular. Like I do a lot of DIYing in my modules. So um, the average cost to me to have a new module by non-linear non circuits 
all parts is like about 50 bucks or so. I'll pay like 35 for the panel and PCB. But I have a big stock of capacitors and resistors, all the op amps and diodes that he uses, and it mainly uses similar designs. So that doesn't cost, that's not a whole lot of cost to have a new module. And there's no stigma against people who go that way. So it's not that it, it, there's a weird thing where the DIY modules are in a separate system of value. Oh, well, you invested your time into it. So that shows a commitment to it. So there is an alternative pathway, but most of the DIYers don't really save money because they spend, they like, oh, I'm going to DIY three modules and then they do 30 and then they've spent just as much as they had bought the three modules that they wanted originally. So we get a lot of contradictions there too. So, and again, I'm generalizing, there will always be exceptions to these particular like typologies, but I'm trying to deal with like really common typology scenarios that any of you might encounter if you went to any modular gathering, whether you go to Brighton Modular or over to Aldershot for ModCAF or go over to Bristronica in Bristol. It was an event that happened last weekend. I was there, or, or Synthfest in Sheffield, anyone, wants to take a jaunt up to Sheffield tomorrow, you can see this in action there, right? So you, you'll find these contradictory positions that are very sternly held. Um, uh, regarding serendipity, yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of, um, serendipity would be you know, one adjectival that we could use to refer to the what people describe about the possibilities of having all those controls immediately available there. But I think also in contrast, there are companies like SoftTube or whatever that make these controllers that have a lot of knobs there. You could map two things. You could have a lot of knobs sitting there that should do the same thing, but almost no one does that. So, I mean, there is, yeah, there, there it's, it, that's true, but then there would be ways around that as well that are kind of unwieldy to get set up and are not much fun to get set up because then you're dealing with that second interfacing problem that I talked about, getting hardware to play with other hardware, getting hardware to play with the software. Oh, then you map the wrong CC value. Oh, I need to send SysX dump <laughs> from one device to another. And you're like, I haven't made any music all night and it's still not working yet, right thing. So that is like, ah, I just buy some you know hardware modular and turn some knobs. I think the other thing though, that's also weird would be that people of course, there are menu diving modules <laughs> uh, that are, you know, uh, particularly modal interface ones, like some of the mutable ones that are actually popular, even though they're really can be quite frustrating if you forget, like, for example, Mutable Instruments Platts module, which is a fantastic oscillator. If you forget that the fourth green program, uh, the frequency knob is actually not frequency anymore, but it's something else. And they, <laughs> you know, then you're like, oh, and you have to get out the manual. So, I mean, in a sense, there also is the, what we're talking about with this frustration of a computer interface, but without even having enough display to really see what's going on there, but people still stick with it and use it there. So again, there would be kind of contradictions there, but I totally hear what you're saying about the serendipity being like one of many sort of values for a lot of modules would be a real, yeah, serendipity. Uh, again, it's similar to the sort of happy accidents idea, the accident, hap uh, the happy accidents being a, a good serendipity, uh, you know, kind of thing. Uh, definitely, that'd be a key part. I mean, for any individual user, they're going to have their own combination of adjectives that for them would be, you know, the things that they're looking for that helps them express their selfhood. So it sounds like for you, serendipity, uh, for me, it's like I really like feedback patching that gets to this A-stable place and that you change one thing and suddenly we're in a totally different piece. And that's great. I love that, even though it sounds pretty gnarly. So it's not exactly serendipity, but that, that's just my thing. So both of those can happen in the same instrument, which is really cool. Uh, so I think that contributes to it. Also, the idea, some people argue that because like VCV rack, it runs on a laptop. It's a general purpose device. It's not a music device. It, this laptop, I'm presenting on Zoom on it. I write my books on it. Uh, it's like you want to make music, you want to have a different thing, a different object, whether it's one of those uh, tubas that you have there or the, or the modular synthesizers that you also have there or that we, that a couple in the room here, right? So that idea of like uh, having like, oh, now I'm really making music because I've shifted to a different object is for some people very, very important. Um, and performance, obviously, uh, there's that sort of meme of, or, or I, almost like a meme of like, is the performer actually just checking their email or are they actually playing, playing, a, you know, doing something on the computer? Uh, that's never a question on modular. It's, uh, well, even though it's hard to tell actually what people 
live performance stuff and modular is always doing. It's not always tell, uh, easy to tell what the causal relation is, but at least you tell that they're doing something that's a purposeful activity that is very music specific, right? Yeah. Hopefully that kind of uh, touched on uh, some of your questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, I could talk to you for like hours about this, but I won't for everyone else's sake. So yeah, thanks very much. Right. Thank you. There's a, there's a YouTube question. Uh, oh, cool. Okay, so I guess there is some questions on YouTube. Uh, okay, so it says from Rick Adrians, hi, Elliot, thanks for such a rich and fascinating talk. Sorry, I couldn't make it in person. I was fascinated with your short reflection on your experiences as a performer and organizer and how people tend to be more interested in what module did you use than any musical elements. Could you say a bit more about the role of auto ethnography in your project and how you balance the role between critical insider and sympathetic outsider. To what extent would you say are the arguments that the culture is more about gear fetishism, haptic feedback, and the conversational needs than purely the music itself? Also true for your own engagement. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, methods, yeah, I, I didn't uh, I didn't really detail them uh, here for this. Uh, there'll be more discussion uh, probably in the book about it, but um, I mean, I've been working, I started by researching modular synthesizers as a total, not a total outsider. I mean, I had played them back in the 90s when I studied electroacoustic composition um, at the university and then kind of was doing other things. And when I started this project, I was very interested in the idea of modularity as a, as a sort of design parameter that helped innovation. Like it was a very, was a pretty naive question, not a very interesting question in fact because uh, it's been <laughs> discussed in you know many journals and in many contexts for years um and, but then started going to uh, trade shows related to this and and checking out the online spaces on uh, multiple uh i didn't we didn't have the gear culture concept uh codified at that point we're just looking at recording studio objects looking at vinyl records we were looking at yeah there was a few of us that were kind of working on uh, different kinds of material culture related to music and trying to ask questions about music's material culture. So it began as a, as a outsider and I had no intent of actually buying a modular or participating as a performer. I wanted to not replicate my prior study, which was, I was very enmeshed in a studio context and writing about the studio context I was enmeshed in. Uh, and then that kind of got complicated with when I moved to New York and some people in the New York Modular Society that I met, I wanted to start going to some of their events. And they basically, uh, you know, I, I was kind of strong armed into, into joining the scene more as a, a, as a practitioner. And also, re also realized I was going to reach the limits of what I could, I could explain about the things that I saw people saying online, unless I tried to have some practical experience. Like people talk about a certain feeling of that. Can I replicate that? Like, can I replicate the way that people describe feeling about using their modular? Or can I replicate, yeah, you know, all these sort of things. Like, otherwise it's like someone saying the story about it. Like I have, I don't have it from personal experience. I can't necessarily, I can try to empathize with it, but I don't have the same feeling. So I thought, well, okay, let's just do a little bit of stuff and see. And then it just kind of spiraled out of control as things often do um, and got, yeah, quite, enmeshed with this new group that had formed um, then COVID hit, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and we switched to becoming a big live streaming platform. Uh, so I suddenly was involved in producing events, um, you know, that were happening several times a week at peak, uh, big festivals that we were doing, oh, well, let's do a festival tomorrow. <laughs> very impromptu kind of thing. So things have it's been a very very mixed mode uh, kind of thing, uh, which has its own problems. Um, I'm not really writing in the book about musicians or music really much at all. I just decided just to kind of cut that off. Though many people that I write about also do music and are musicians, but I decided to deal more with manufacturers, YouTube content creators, everyone working in the infrastructure around it to understand the how the gear comes to life and stuff like that. Uh, which I realize has its limitations, but you have to draw a limit somewhere. But in terms of autoethnography, yeah, none of these are initially generated from my own uh, sense of this. I would see, I would, you know, do like quantitative analysis of form threads. How do people, what are the adjectives people use to describe a certain kind of thing? Maybe like an interfacing or like knob turning or whatever it is. 
you know, what are the adjectives that people are using? What's the vocabulary in which people describe this experience? And then collect hundreds and hundreds of these. Is there a correlation of any sort? Is there a consistency? And then drill down to, okay, what, what does that mean? Where, where do we go from there? And I try to train myself to replicate that feeling. So I've been trying to more respond to like, how do I, <laughs> um, uh, how do I conform myself to things that I am seeing other people experience rather than just like, this is my musical aesthetics and I'm coming in, I'm a performer, I'm just writing about it myself. Not that I think you were suggesting that autoethnography would be that, but I mean, autoethnography, again, deals with the question of like, how does the performer's body or the performer of research, I mean, how would that, uh, you know, uh, influence research results in part, you know, it, you know, your presence could be disruptive and thus require people to create a problem, require people to respond to that problem. That would be in the form of ethnomethodology is a certain branch of related to autoethnography where you try to create these crises or problems in the research site and then see how people respond. I'm not doing that. Um, so I'm trying to avoid that sort of approach, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, and again, I think the key thing is trying to see what is shared between different spaces. So, you know, online trade shows or a, or a concert those should be really different, right? They, they're they kind of not like each other, but there's so much crossover of things that you find. So that becomes interesting to me. And I kind of probably, yeah, I, I, you know, really hone in on those details. Um, yeah, yeah, that that's just sort of an idea. Um, there's much more specific methods I could talk about another time, but, um, you know, certain kinds of discourse analysis that I use or things like that. Conversation analysis uh, can be very useful to understanding inflection and utterances. It can be done even with online posts. Uh, sometimes it produces meaningless results, but sometimes it's very useful, uh, particularly for emotional, seeing how emotions are added to a technical explanation or something uh, can be good. Uh, but yeah, thanks, Rick. Nice to see you. <laughs> yes. You said that there's in these uh, like uh, trade shows or whatever, uh, there's lots of people that buy lots of things, but then never use them or like use them very limitedly. But then they could have like these very expensive rags. Um, are these rags like functional in the sense of, um, and this is related really to the second question, but the first question would be like in a rag, you would need like a few oscillators, a few filters, like envelope generators. These people that buy these expensive gear, are they thinking about this? Are they thinking like, if I was to perform, could I perform with it? Or are they thinking more like, Oh, I've seen that my favorite artist uses this model. Or like, I really like the feeling of our gear. I could see her model. Like, you get there's this website where you can see like each artist, which like grid they have. Oh, modular, grid, yeah, modular grid, pieces. for example. Yeah. I want to make her bits and pieces, but like, do their uh, like um tracks make sense in that sense? And what I mean, and the second question is about what does it even mean that it makes sense? But like, uh, why this like uh, right. uh do they do that? Do they think about this? Um. Well, this becomes a this can become a contentious online discussion, and I've seen it where people will post a modular grid of something that they're intending to buy, right? And it will often be entirely a a, a, a system filled with the most talked about modules from the last three months that have all been released. And you look at it, and it's like it's a you know, it's a 6U 104 HP case with seven full featured oscillators in it. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do with that? You know, there's nothing to modulate anything. There's no utility modules of any sort at all. So then you'll find uh, some people will gently, initially gently push against this and say, well, maybe you might want to make it a bit more performable by having something that you can modulate any of these parameters with, because look at all those jacks there that you'll have nothing going into. You're not able to control any of that. And you can find then ideological ideas, people saying, the real heart of a modular patch is the utility modules. Utility modules are the king or the star of the show. People, these are exact quotes people have said. By utility, I mean like a, a you know, a sequential switch or, you know, yeah, uh, uh, analog shift register or a comparator or XOR, you know, you know, some sort of logic module or things like that that don't make any sound directly. And then this becomes a weird thing because sometimes that person just really wanted to buy those modules, but yes, that rack would be barely performable. 
uh, it wouldn't make much sense and it would not actually get the full range of sounds that maybe they were attracted to in that if they don't understand synthesis. I'm not going to say that most people are that way, though. You just find many evidence in all the different communities I've been. You'll find someone that has managed to cobble together that very peculiar rack that I would, I just look at it and like, I would never want to plug that in. I just, I don't know what I would do, you know, because there's, there's no L, there's no LFOs in it, or it's like, you know, um, and then you'll find the opposite, like someone who wants to show that they're really good at modular, who's like, my rack has 10 maths and that's it. And like the big point showing off that they know how to use function generators to produce oscillators and filters and, and rectifiers and all that sort of stuff. That's like, haha, I'm showing off. So you find the opposite of people like doing funny moves like that. So again, uh, but again, the objects become that key site where you can like play out differing epistemes, different ideas and knowledge of what people are trying to do. I don't know. I'm not crawling into people's homes uh, privately to see what they actually do behind closed doors. So I don't really know. I do know that there's some people that are like, oh, I would never make a recording with my modular and they never perform live. So they're obviously, if they're playing anything, they might just be having an oscillator going to a filter and doing filter sweep and just content with doing that. We don't know what they do because they don't talk about doing anything with it. They only talk about buying and wanting modules. And that's not a, considered a problem. You don't have to prove that you're a musician by bringing music to the table in order to participate in the discussion. You do have to prove that you have you own modules though. So that makes it very different than a, so some music communities were like, yeah, well, show me that you can play, you know, funky drummer break or whatever on the drums. If you can't pull that off, you're probably not going to get in certain kinds of bands if you can't, if you don't have the chops and and a certain familiarity with prior music and thus how to mediate between existing music and your own performance practice. You don't have to prove that in this space. That said, there are fantastic musicians that are doing great stuff. It's not that that, that doesn't exist. Uh, people that are very knowledgeable about synthesis in these same spaces. But that's the, 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 when, you, when you peel off the layers, it's the gear ownership that is more important as, a, as the gateway than the, than the musical things. We're trying to change that a bit, um, at least in New York Modular Society, and also uh, do various things. We've partnered with a synth lending library that's trying to help get maybe like a Mother 32 or a DFAM to someone who might want to start that journey and not have money to do that. Um, in Portland, Oregon, and also in Prague and the Czech Republic, there are synth lending libraries uh, that are also helping do that. Uh, Bristol Communal Modular now has a 12U performance rack that its members can use for free. So that could be their way. You could start to participate without having to have an outlay of cash. Bristol Community Modular, awesome folks. I encourage you to meet them, become friends with them. Some of the loveliest, loveliest people I've met in the UK involved in synthesis today. So yeah, there's that's hopefully we'll get more things like that, community things, that initiatives that create more opportunities for people to get into that, that don't require, where's your 10,000 quid? Yeah. In this direction, um, another question I had, and I think this relates to what you were saying about this, uh, is it one in mass community? Um, so there is like um, like a typical way of doing things, right? Like you have, as you said, like you have a oscillators, a few oscillators, then you will have your LFOs, you need to modulate them further. And then someone comes and says like, oh, I have 10 math uh, models. And I was wondering, the 10 math models is like showing off, okay, I can do modular, and I know how to do modular with a function generation, a generator, as you were saying, but like, I wonder what uh, what is the role of experimentation in here? And my experimentation, I mean, oh, I had this, I was, because we talked a lot about of synesthesia in modular playing, but I feel that the synesthesia is like, oh, I wired so many things that I don't even know what's going on, and that's what we call synesthesia. But I wonder, the more like crazy way of like, oh, I bought these models that I've never seen someone play, putting together, but I realized that if I put them together, this happens. Right. And in a more naive way, not that much like, oh, I'm showing off. It's more of this. And that's how I approach it because like, I learned a lot about acoustics in my degree. And then I was shown a model and I was, oh, oh, okay. I know all of these words, but I haven't produced music in my life. So I don't I don't see why you would use an LFO to moderate things. I like how it sounds on its own. Sure. Um, um, and I wonder like how these, 
more like naive approaches. And by naive, I know, don't mean something that's bad. I want, I just mean like yeah. a more like uh, open way to uh, working with those things in those like masculine hegemonic uh, forums that will be very like, oh no, this is how you use things or like with this rag, you're not going anywhere. Um, how is this regarded? Is this regarded as something, oh, cool, we like experimenting or is it more like you have no idea what you're doing if you're doing something that's nice, that's just like a uh, beginner's level. I mean, uh, it kind of, I mean, one of the problems in some of the online forums is, is that there's so little discussion of musical practice and process. Mm -hmm. So you're more likely, where I have heard that, though, for example, because I've done a lot of interviews with manufacturers at this point, I've commonly heard that one of the things that manufacturers really like at trade shows is someone that they've never met comes up and repatches their modular and comes up with outcomes from their modules that they had no idea that their own modules would ever produce, or they would never think of patching it that way because it's maybe wrong or it's unusual or something like that. And then they hear it and it's like, this is really awesome. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that manufacturers are, key, are some of them, uh, not all of them, but I mean, some of them are very keenly interested in seeing users pushing the limits of the modules that they make. And then they get really excited by discovering these new potentials or things like this. And since a lot of the manufacturers are also players, you know, they also play music too. They have that sort of musician interest of like, oh, that's really cool. I like what you did there kind of thing. Um, yeah, in the online spaces, you know, there's just a lot less discussion about musical practice in that way. Uh, you know, maybe someone who talks about gear all the time will suddenly post an album and maybe answer some questions about it, but you're kind of missing the entire, you know, a few people have done this sort of step-by-step -step of how the, here's the modules I bought, here's my first patch, and then they upload that. You can get some sense of their trajectory to becoming a musician on that instrument, but that's very rare. Like it's a handful of people that have done that, that I've come across. So yeah, and I would love to see more discussion of musical practice. Yeah, we're trying to encourage that in our, some of our events, like, you know, uh, people come up, hey, let's talk about musical practice, you know, rather than talking about, you know, which module uh, did you use for that? We're talking about the feelings that the music made for you. And then like, you know, talking about like the rest of the world does, because <laughs> you know? we, it is a sensory thing. We feel it, uh, we do have feelings as a result of hearing any musical performance that could be positive or negative or a mix, uh, but, being getting back in touch with that and like what are the choices you made that produced those feelings you know let's share that you know and other people that want to produce those feelings can do a similar kind of thing but yeah no, i don't i don't see people dunking so much of like you used the modular wrong at least in euro rack because again the happy accidents thing is kind of a given um you know, some people will be frustrated that people actually sometimes it will be a frustration that, for example, people will just buy an 808 kick drum module rather than learning how to patch it properly. You know, they'll be like, I would never buy an all-in-one drum module. And there's some people just like, I just need an 808 in there. It's just it's cool, you know. So that would be a that would be a debate, but it's a debate around like your approach to putting modules together to make the exact same sound, not the a question about patching in a weird way that results in a new outcome as you were kind of describing. I've never seen any complaints about that per se, because again, there's not that much discussion about practice workflow, you know? Um, yeah, but yeah, thanks, great questions. Okay. You mentioned earlier about people making their own modules and the sort of DIY approach to it. And I was wondering sort of to what extent does the sort of hacker and maker cultures feed into the uh, modular city community and, and that sort of area as well. Well, yeah, how much does the hacker and maker community feed into modular? It can for some people, and there are some cities that will have maker spaces that also allow soldering and things like that, in which case you might find a, a space that's a co-working space that also has a 3D printer and has whatever, and also has a metal working, a CNC machine, and, and people are soldering there. Uh, most of the DIY soldering workshops I've seen happen at trade shows or happen at separate spaces. So, so there'll be people who are just assembling modules that never have done the other kinds of making. So it's not a, it's not always together. Uh, that said, at Dutch Modular, there is a, uh, I think it's a maker space. I'm not sure how they would define it. Acid Solder Club um, that obviously is doing stuff beyond just people coming and taking kits and soldering it together. 
uh, Michelle Vosen had a <clears throat> had a piece at, uh, in in the main exhibition hall that was this big five story cat tree that had all these sort of wearable fabrics and sensors and encouraged people to pretend like they're cats in order to control <laughs> parameters on the modular synthesizer, which I thought was pretty cool. But I've never seen that per se at another space that seemed to be unique to Utrecht, Netherlands. Um, so some people though get really into the DIYing to the extent then they buy a you know a, a reflow oven that they have in their kitchen and then it starts to spiral out of control they get a drill press to do their own front panels and then i don't know uh we've had four businesses start just amongst the new york modular conversations uh one person that has made a ribbon controller another person makes a lot of fuzz and overdrive and distortion modules so and those no one at the four years ago if i'd asked them none of them would have said you know one's a you know, one is a, a PhD in history guy, had never made anything in his life, just really got into this stuff. <laughs> and now he's made his own really cool ribbon controller with a little breakout URAC module. So people have just gotten so into that, the practice of it, like the feeling of, of soldering often, the, the you know, kinesthetic aspects of it, that then they go further um, with it. And then they're like, well, I really need this thing to do, but it doesn't exist. And they start making their own a lot of the makers are very open to sharing knowledge about this too. Certain ones are actually quite notorious for like actually giving full day sessions to help, you know, upcoming, you know, businesses or a person wants to make a module. Here's how you deal with the logistics of PCB. Here's a, you know, PCB manufacturing, avoid this company, work with this company, make sure your Gerber files have these parameters in it. And they're giving away basically what would in another industry be considered trade secrets and, and encouraging more people to enter the space because maybe someone did that for them previously. So there's an altruistic and sort of sharing uh, culture, not, uh, not with everyone, but it's a pretty dominant thing to the extent that a lot of people might say that's characteristic of the maker side of things. So Rick, back to your question. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing that I'm very interested in is that community of people that the public doesn't really know anything about at all. They wouldn't see that behind the scenes what's going on as these manufacturers or designers are, you know, collaborating and doing cool stuff behind the scenes. Uh, I mean, there's, there's interesting social dynamics too that I won't talk about at the moment, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty inspiring, yeah. Yeah, there's a hand up uh, by Franco. Yeah. Go ahead, Franco. Elliot, hey Jordi, thank you so much for for the talk. It was very very cool. I wanted to ask you a question about about the companies actually trying to cater for for this community because it seems to be a relatively small community but with a lot of buying power, right? Have you had any interesting example of, of these companies trying to to talk directly to this or to advertise gear directly to this community? And what do you think about bigger companies where I guess it's a thin line between um, targeting directly to this company and to a wider musical uh, spectrum of, of users? Well, I mean, a f yeah, I mean, a few... Um... A few larger companies like uh, Behringer and Roland, uh, you know, have come up with, uh, uh, came out uh, Earthquaker pedals, uh, you know, more recently, uh, who else, Eventide, um, have come up with a few modules. Uh, one of the problems for any big, a huge company is that if you're used to producing at least 10,000 of a gizmo, you have a very particular approach to manufacturing. And in your Iraq, it, you know, most small manufacturing runs for an untested product would be like 100 or 200. So you can't work with the same process at all. It's a totally different idea about how to work with parts and part sourcing and things like that. It has its own certain problems. And a lot of the bigger companies we've noticed don't really quite understand the space because you would imagine that like Roland being a very successful uh, company, if they release a module, it's going to be the top selling module. But they're, I mean, if you look at any of the Roland reissue modules, they're like down to the maybe 100th most popular module. I mean, they are, they were, they're, they're fine. And some people that wanted them, bought them and used them, uh, you know, Waldorf, another company that made some URAC modules that didn't, never really caught, caught on. 
they often don't really understand the very specific uh, sensibilities of the consumers there, and they take too much of their own aesthetic uh, based off of a very highly professional design aesthetic, I should say, uh, and a very, a very key gestalt that they have about what defines a successful object. And that's really different than the space that is partly a grassroots thing that was invented, you know, that was kind of relaunched in 1995 on a email mailing list where a bunch of either techs or random DIYers were trying to like, hey, I want to make my own modular because no one's making them today. And, you know, Grant Richter and, you know, other, you know, other folks, Dieter Dopfer were participating in the synth DIY mailing list and all sharing info about whatever they could find. And there's a whole set of archives called Electro Notes that has all these circuits, some of which it's, are, are untested about whether they have a musical utility or value or not. So in Eurac, it's much more interesting to like take Electro Notes 129 and see if you can make it into something and then see if anyone might be interested in it. But Roland's never going to do that. Uh, you know, they're never going to approach things that way. So yeah, some of the modules that are really you know caught on would have been, seemed so weird from a marketing perspective, how are you going to convince your marketing department to, how are you going to sell this thing to people? Uh, so it's been quite interesting to see that, in fact, Eurex's success has largely been because it's been so, it can be quick and nimble and resilient, and it has so few people uh, working in a company, they don't have to have a one person working there can just come up with a, you know, module prototype, they can just make a hundred, it's very low risk, you know, uh, you're probably going to sell a hundred, if it sells really quickly, make it another 300 and hope that those sell. And then, you know, you know, okay, people want it, make another 300. And it's like, you can be quite, you can be quite nimble that way in a way that a large company with, you know, CEOs and marketing departments would not, and, you know, project, project managers would not be able to handle that, you know? So, I mean, uh, I think that that really affects things quite a bit. And again, Behringer's clones, uh, they don't really aesthetically look very good. They don't really understand the jack spacing or the knob spacing that most Eurac users are expecting. So they don't really feel quite as good as the originals. Um, they look ugly. Uh, so they don't really get the aesthetics of that space because someone in the team that came up with this is has obviously never experienced Eurac, they were told to clone the module and they didn't really know what that meant. And so they used the wrong color scheme or things like this, right? So they kind of had this brownish tint to it and no one wants brown on their face plates and everyone's a black face or a silver face, right? You know, it's the key thing. They didn't do their market research really in that sense about the inter people's uh, you know, interfacial. So I imagine a company is going to probably create alternative faceplates for the Behringer ones. They're going to have to. So then that will be someone making money off of Behringer's <laughs> mistake there. The faceplates will cost as much as the module did, but you know, <laughs> you'll find funny little like you know chains of enunciations. I guess that way, if that makes any sense. But I, I don't know. I, I think I only partly touched on your question, but hopefully. No, no, no. Yeah, no. That that was very good. You you went deeper, actually. Yes, I I was trying to to, to ask you about the more about the, the advertisement side, actually, on, on whether some of these companies were trying to like participating in these forums, were were trying to cater to this to this community by by actually either being part of them or understanding yeah. what the community. But but you touch upon this this. Um, I mean, uh, uh, I would say that the. For a, a company that really wants their module to get out there, getting DivKid to review it is the key. That's the key, you know, gating item. If if Ben will review it for you, you will sell a few hundred, you know, right off the bat because his reviews, his review walkthroughs are educational videos just as much as they're also a product. They're not really a product demo. They often become the manual that people use. Like I'll go back to his videos for certain modules that are quite complex. They're fantastic videos, right? He's really good at making them. Jeremy at Red Means Recording, also really, really good. He has a very different style. He presents different parts of these modules when he reviews them. So like, yeah, getting one of the two of them or a few other people to review your module, that is the advertising, right? That's the thing. You can try a campaign with glossies and all this sort of stuff, but it doesn't really, uh, it's not gonna reach the audience in the same way. You can post in the forums, uh, but some module, you, uh, some module manufacturers, for example, become very active Discord users on one channel and 
like so for example, I'm not going to say who, but there's a couple of companies that beta test all their modules through our Discord channel. And then kind of there was a bit of a hype as some of us are using it and we're testing out this thing. It's, wow, this is fantastic. And suddenly everyone's like, what is it? I want to buy it, but it doesn't exist yet or things like that. And then by the time it does come out, there's 50 people queued up to ready, ready to buy it because there's been so much chatter about it. So that grassroots kind of thing that feels organic and feels not like marketing, a lot of people prefer that to the like, coming tomorrow, the new through zero oscillator for mail and busy circuits. You know, I mean, that's not going to necessarily, <laughs> you know, uh, work very well. Uh, you know, to some of this, uh, to some of this crap. So hopefully that gives you some sense. Uh, dramatic radio voice there for accent, and uh, there we go. Uh, if anyone needs uh, over-the-top marketing for their modules, let me know. <laughs> I can do voiceover anytime. Uh, yeah, cool. Perfect. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. That was fabulous. Thank you so much, Elliot. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. And thank you, everyone watching. Oh.